Hi there, my name is Mark Simpson, and this video is a crash course tutorial on Adobe Illustrator CS6. Uh, it's for those of you who have never used the program before, have very limited experience with it, uh, and we're just going to be going over some basic tools to get you started. Uh, Adobe Illustrator is a vector-based illustration program. It's great for designing charts and graphs, uh, logos, maps, uh, editing and modifying architectural drawings, basically any anything that isn't a photograph or a, a pixel-based image. So let's get started. So the first thing when you open up Illustrator uh, is you're going to want to create a new file uh, up here in the file new and when you click that, you're given this new document prompt, so we can enter a name. So let's call this practice. Uh, the profile, I rarely ever use this, um, just because most of the time, whenever I'm using Illustrator for anything, it's because I'm going to design something inside of the program that's going to get exported to another program like Photoshop or InDesign. Um, Number of artboards is the number of workspaces that you'll have. Uh, so we can start with one, and then you can define the size of the artboard. So in this case, it's a letter size, which means 8.5 by 11, tabloids 11 by 17, uh, and then you have some other uh, less, less typical sizes. You can also edit the size of the artboard here. Uh, the default is points, which is a layout graphic design measurement but then you can come over here and change it to like inches so if you know that you're like eight and a half by eleven or let's say you were laying out a poster which is thirty six inches by thirty six inches uh, and then bleeds are great if you're going to be exporting this for print and you want uh, a full bleed which means colors going all the way off the edge um, but for our purposes here I'm gonna stick with a letter and then in the advanced drop down menu here, you can change uh, the color mode. So CMYK is generally for print, and RGB is generally for on screen uh, applications like websites and things. Uh, always keep it a high, high PPI, um, which is the points per inch. Um, so yeah, I, I just don't change any of these. All right, so I'm going to hit OK. All right, so here we have uh, my artboard, which is in white, and then my workspace, which is surrounded by it. Uh, so just to start us off, to orient us to navigation, in order to zoom in and out, uh, there's a couple ways to do it. Um, you can hit the uh, command or control um, with a plus sign or a minus sign, and that's going to zoom in and out. So this is uh, command or control with plus or minus. Also, if you hold the alt key, while you roll the mouse wheel, uh, the third mouse wheel, that will zoom in and out pretty smoothly. Uh, to pan, you, what I usually do is I'll hold the spacebar key and then it will give me this hand, which is the pan tool. And then you can just uh, drag the artboard to the left and the right. Uh, or you can grab uh, these guys over here on the side to move everything up and down. So that's how we we navigate the workspace. So what I'm going to do is just uh, zoom out just to show you uh, what we're working with here. So basically this is my artboard. I can make as many artboards as I want. This dark gray box is my workspace and then anything outside the workspace um, is invalid and it won't let you make anything out there. So just try and make sure you're always working within an artboard on uh, in the center there. Okay, so just to give an overview of some of the anatomy. So this is the, the window that we're working with. This is your workspace. Uh, up top here is the application bar. So here's where you'll find a lot of your menu options and um, places where you can make changes and edits, select objects and things like that. Uh, right below that, this where it says no selection, this is the object bar, which is right below. And so this will have a lot of great options. And you'll see this change as your tools change. Uh, all of your tools are over here on the left side, so this is your toolbar, and then your right side over here, this is your panels. So these are the, um, uh, these contain different uh, commands and modifiers for the geometry that you'll be generating. So I usually like to have, click on that little uh, arrow there, so it tightens up the toolbar a little bit. Um, 
yeah, great. And so any of these, you can like move these around. They don't have to stay on the side. Um, and if you click and drag them to the side over here, you'll see that it'll, it will it will snap to the edges. So I just usually like to keep things on the sides over there. Okay, so we have our new artboard. We're familiar. Here's our toolbar, panel, uh, options bar, and application bar. Um, so let's start making some geometry. Um, so your toolbar is broken up into different sections based on what they do, and you can see them indicated by this dark line here. So these, these top four are, these are selection tools, uh, and then the ones below here, these generate uh, geometry. So uh, your pen tool, your line tool, this is a shape tool, um, and then these will uh, erase and modify. Uh, these are like rotate and scale and command tools. Uh, and then you have a couple others um, that I'm not going to get into because it's uh, this is too quick of a tutorial. Tutorial, but as you can see, as I mouse over, you get this cursor tool tip that just tells you not only what the tool is, but then also the hotkey in order to select it. So with my type tool here, which generates a type box, I can either click it, and then my icon changes, or alternatively, I can hit the T key, and that will activate that tool for me. Okay, so let's start with a couple of the basic ones. Um, the one that's probably the most specific, uh, or the first one to get into, is the line segment tool. Um, so you just click that, and you see how my cursor changes to this cross. And so with that, I can just sort of click and drag to make lines. Okay? Uh, and notice that when I click once and start moving the line, it fixes. it's fixed at the point where I first clicked. And so the second one, once I release, will be uh, relative to that first click. Uh, alternatively, if you know the exact dimension of the line that you want, you can click once, and then you get this uh, pop-up menu that asks you how long do you want to make it, and then the angle. So if I know I want to make an 8-inch line, and I want it to be at 90 degrees, I can just enter that and hit OK, and then there it is. That's my line right there. OK, but I'm going to hit uh, Control or Command Z to undo that. And let's take a look at another one. This is the rectangle tool. Uh, for all of these tools on the toolbar, when it has this little white triangle in the corner, that means if you click and hold it, you'll get this flyout menu with a bunch of sub options. So the rectangle tool makes rectangles, rounded rectangle uh, makes a rectangle with round corners, ellipse is for circles and ovid shapes, uh, the polygon tool is for uh, polygon, star, and flare. Pretty straightforward. So I'm going to start with this rectangle tool. And again, this is just clicking and dragging, and you make a rectangle. Pretty straightforward. I can come here with my ellipse tool, click and drag that. And so you see I'm making a ellipse, which is rotating around the initial point that I clicked when I first started. OK? couple important modifiers at this point uh, you should keep in mind. Um, one is if you're working with, let's say, the line tool, and I click and drag, like right now you can see my next to my cursor, it's telling me two things. It's telling me how long the line is, so the number of inches, and then it's also telling the angle that the line's at relative to zero. If you hold down the shift key while dragging the line, it will fix the line to a 0, 45, or 90 degree angle. So that's perfect if you're working in a more precise environment and you want to have uh, a particular length or angle. Okay. Uh, alternatively, if I hold the Alt button, and you see what it's doing now, is it will draw a line that is emanating from the center point, which is the first point that I clicked uh, when I started making the line. So again, this is useful if you know you want to do something like, let's say, off this corner. You can see this smart tooltip is telling me I'm over the, the anchor, which is the corner point of the square. And so if I click and start dragging off of that corner, it's going to make something relative to there. I could also hold the shift while I hold Alt, and then not only am I emanating from the center, but it's also uh, stuck at orthographic degrees of 0, 90, and 45. Okay? Um, so now that I made all this geometry, it's kind of a mess. To, in order to select geometry, 
there are two main selection tools up here. There's this black arrow, which is the selection tool, and then this white arrow, which is the direct selection tool. Uh, the black selection tool is, is, is generally your default selection to in that tool, and that just allows you, if you click and drag, you make a square or a box, and that will select any geometry inside or that is touching the box. So if I let go, we see that all these things are highlighted, and so now if I hit delete, that clears the artboard. With the ellipse tool, if you want to make a circle, you hold down the shift key. And what that does is it does a proportional scale operation. So you can see next to my tooltip cursor, uh, the width and the height are identical values as long as I hold the shift key. And as soon as I let go of the shift key, then they start moving uh, around based on where I'm clicking and are no longer fixed to any proportional relationship. Uh, and then if I hold shift and alt, it makes a circle from the center point. And this is true for all of the polygon tools. If you hold that alt key, it's going to grow from the center rather than from the corner. And sometimes this is more helpful when you're drawing um, shapes like this because you're more interested about the center point than you are about one of the quadrant points. Okay, so I made a circle. Let's talk about the direct selection tool. This varies from the selection tool. The selection tool, when you click anywhere on any part of, of the geometry, it selects all of the geometry as one unit and then gives me these outside handles with which I can manipulate the circle. So if I click and drag here, it starts to move the circle in relationship to the bounding box. right? And so this is helpful for rectangles and things. It's not so helpful with circles because uh, you might want to keep it you know, perfectly circular and not have some weird oval shape. Or maybe you do, I don't know. Um, but th so that's the selection tool. Now what varies, what differs with the direct selection tool is that if I click this path, a couple things happen. First the path gets highlighted and then these four anchor points at the top, the sides, and the bottoms are, are white, they're hollow. And I can zoom in here and you can see so basically what I'm looking at is this path is the center line that's going down this black stroke. And then this anchor point is defining uh, the geometry of the circle. So if I click it once, you'll see that it turned a dark blue, whereas over here on the bottom, it's still a uh, hollow anchor point. So what that's telling me is that right now this anchor point is activated and selected. So if I click and drag it, what it's going to do is it's going to move the point relative to the path and significantly alter the geometry. So you, see, you can start to see how you can form some weird shapes. It's almost like you're sculpting with the line work. You can move them independent of each other. So those are anchors. The stroke is what connects the anchors. And then these guys that are emanating from the center of the anchor point, these are called handles. And what the handles do is they change the path of the stroke as it passes through the anchor point. So if I click and grab this handle, I can start rotating and moving the path relative to this fixed anchor point. Okay? Uh, and then by moving, by making the handle longer and shorter, it starts pulling and pushing the path relative to that anchor point. So this is a, a good example of how uh, illustrators uh, can work within um, this program is you start by making some standard what I would call primitives. These are just like basic basic forms, um, platonic forms. And, um, and yeah, and then you just uh, come in here with the direct selection tool, click the path, and then you can start grabbing and manipulating points to create some new and interesting geometries out of an existing geometry. One more thing before we move on about the selection tool is that if you click the selection tool and then you get this bounding box, if you click and drag on the handles, that's gonna change the geometry. But if you come to the corners and you just get close to the corners, you notice that my cursor changes to this double-headed curved arrows. And what that's indicating to me is that now if I click and drag, it's gonna rotate the shape. So that's how you can rotate things quickly um, in Illustrator. Uh, and then these are how you can scale things pretty quickly. Uh, alternatively, there's a scale and rotate tool. So the scale tool here, if you click it once, 
uh, that blue circle is your uh, anchor point. So as I click and drag in relation to the anchor point, it's going to scale the geometry. And then alternatively with uh, the rotate tool, if I click the rotate or hit R for the rotate tool, it will allow me to rotate the geometry around that fixed point. Okay, so with this in mind, let's talk about the pen tool. Now, the pen tool, I think, intimidates a lot of people because they don't know what to expect from it. They, they expect it to operate more like the pencil tool. Now, the pencil tool is a pretty helpful tool if you just are, are drawing something on your artboard. The issue with the pencil tool is that Yes, it's quick at generating geometry like this, and it does uh, normalize and snap anchor points to the stroke, but it's pretty imprecise, and it doesn't have a lot of control, and unless you're using something like a Wacom tablet, uh, it's not, for me at least, very intuitive to draw like this with a mouse. I find it's much more uh, intuitive to use the pen tool when I'm drawing with a mouse. And so how the pen tool works is you, when the pen tool, when you just start, you'll notice my cursor has changed and next to my cursor is a asterisk. And what that's telling me is that I'm starting a new line. So if I click once and then click again and click again, what it's doing is every point I click is creating an anchor point and then threading the path through that point. And now if I come back to the origin, you'll see that my anchor, that my cursor changes again, and uh, that circle at the bottom indicates that if I click one more time, it's going to close the geometry. So now this is one continuous closed shape. I can scale that down. Okay, pretty straightforward, right? So things are a little more complicated when you want to add curves with the pen tool. So... Notice that when I click and make points, they're totally angular. There's no curves. These are all one degree lines, meaning that there's no, no curvature at all. Just a bunch of straight line segments connected. If I want to introduce curvature, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, when I click, I'm not going to let go and I'm going to start to drag. Mm -hmm. And what that's going to do is, is it's going to create uh, anchors that have handles. And so it allows me to, where you start clicking is where the anchor point is, and then as you are holding down the mouse button and extending that handle, it's moving the, uh, the path relative to the anchor point. And so you can use this tool to generate some pretty funky geometry pretty quickly. And then what I really like about it is now that you've made this geometry and you get it in an approximate shape, then you can sort of come back and modify it to get it to where you want it to be. So I think the thing to keep in mind with the pen tool is that once you start off, it's okay if the form that you're making doesn't look exactly how you want it to look, because Illustrator makes it really easy to manipulate geometry once you start making it. Okay, so that's the pen tool. A thing to keep in mind with any of this vector drawing is that these geometries are infinitely scalable. And so what that means is when you're drawing with uh, vectors, in this case anchor points and paths, what you're really doing is you're describing a set of relationships between fixed points. So the important part to Illustrator isn't necessarily the exact distance that these two points are from each other, but more the relative distance as it relates to these handle points, which means that this shape overall can be easily scaled. Either of these can be easily scaled to as big or as small as you want them. So this is when you're, um, you know, when you see a Coca-Cola logo, it looks the exact same on a business card as it does on a billboard, and that's because it's drawn with a vector. So um, it can go it can be any size you need it to be, and that's the real power of this program. Okay, so let's talk about fills and strokes. I'm gonna make some geometry, I'm just gonna make some shapes. Now right now all of these shapes have the same stroke and the same fill, meaning that 
they all have the same stroke, which is a black line, which has a one point width, and they have no fill. And you can see that you can see that indicated by this white square with a red line through it. So it means that they're totally transparent. So you can see one through the other. If you go to your color panel here, which is either on your right size panel menu or window color, you can select any of these geometries and change either the stroke. Let's say I want to make this like a red. So I've changed that so it has a red stroke now. Or alternatively, you can click this, click over here to swap, and now it has a black fill. Uh, and then these slider bars also allow you to start manipulating color. Uh, but really the best thing to do is to either know what kind of color palette you're working with, or sometimes you can use this color picker down here to pick a color that you like. So I kind of like that pastel -y purple. And so this works with all types of geometry, because if I were to, let's say, add a stroke to this guy, so let's say I added a stroke, I can come down to here, which is my stroke panel, or you can go window, stroke, oops, window, stroke, and this allows you to adjust the weight of the stroke, so I can make it really, really thick and heavy. Uh, you can also choose where the stroke is relative to the path. So in this case, the stroke is centered on the path, but I could just as easily move the stroke to the inside of the path or to the outside of the path. Uh, you can also click here and create a dashed line. So in this case, you know, maybe I'd want to bump that size down a little bit. And then I could decrease the size of the dash and maybe increase the size of the gap. So you can see how you can easily start to highlight things and create some shapes. Um, if I come over here to my rectangle tool and I make a rectangle or a square, Notice how once you select from one geometry, it remembers what your stroke and fill options. And so now that I made a new piece of geometry, it's just duplicating that existing uh, stroke and fill. But that's easy to change. I can go in here, change that, go to the color, select this purple. Maybe I want to make this like a red. Uh, and with corners, you can change the corner, so right now it's a super sharp corner, but it could just as easily be like a, cham a rounded corner or a chamfered corner. So pretty subtle, but if you're working with really small geometry, or alternatively, if this stroke starts to get really big, you can start to see that effect more. And then finally, if you're making, if you're making a line, if you're making a line, Let's dial back this weight a little bit. You also, here on the, uh, on the bar up here, on the options bar, you can also adjust not only the stroke, but also um, the stroke color and the fill as well. If you make a line, Illustrator has a bunch of preloaded arrowheads, so you can start to insert a head and maybe a tail, do something really goofy. And if these are too big or too small, like this tail looks really too small, you can come over here and change this value, let's say make it a 50, or, oops, you gotta make sure you select it. So select it and then you can come over here and change it, get a little bit smaller, more manageable. Okay, so those are fills and strokes. Very helpful for when you are drawing anything to have full control over how heavy the lines are uh, and what the fills are. Alternatively, alternatively, if you select a piece of geometry, notice that the only thing that Illustrator really cares about is the the this geometry which is represented in the blue line. So by modifying the fills of the strokes, you're not actually changing the underlying geometry that uh, Illustrator is referencing. Um, and you can actually see this firsthand if you go to View, Overprint Preview, I'm sorry, if you go to View, 
it's one of these in here. Outline, that's it. View outline. That's just going to show you what what it is Illustrator sees. So Illustrator is only observing the, the geometry. And so what's nice about that is that as long as the geometry remains untouched, you can change um, anything you'd like in terms of fills and strokes. Okay, let's talk about layers. Layers are super helpful when working with Illustrator. Uh, you can have find the Layers panel over here on the uh, Panels menu, or if you go to Window Panels, I'm sorry, Window Layers, you can see it's selected there. So let's just, for the sake of argument, I'm just going to make, I'm going to erase some of these guys. And I'm going to add some more squares. What layers allow you to do is uh, similar to many other um, Adobe programs is they allow you to manipulate geometry and organize it to keep everything nice and clean and clear. Um, so let's say I had this layer one and I called it circles. And if you click this button down here to create a new layer, to make a square. And let's make one more for arrow. So right now everything is on the circles menu, circles layer, pardon me, because this was the default layer that we started working with. So you can tell that by a couple ways. One is everything is in blue, which matches the blue color on the layers. Also, when I click this, this ellipse, notice how not only does the layer panel, the line on the layer panel highlight, so it says this is on the circles layer, but also you get a blue uh, square at the end here, which is indicating which layers your selections are on. So right now everything's there. If I wanted to select these three squares, I would hold down the shift key while I did it. One, two, three. Now select the square layer here on the square panel, right click on it, and say go to arrange, and then send a current layer. And what that's going to do, notice how the color changes immediately. This line is highlighted, and you have the red box. So now these three squares are on the square layer. Uh, and let's do one more. Let's select this arrow and put this arrow on the arrow layer. So I'm going to click on the layer on the layers panel, then right click on it and go to arrange, and then send to current layer. So the real power of layers is how it allows you to control the geometry. And this will become more and more important as you're working with uh, artwork that, or projects that just get very complex. If you keep everything organized in the layers panel, it will make it much easier to work around. So as a for example, if I'm working with the circle layers and I'm like, oh, you know, these squares are in the way, it's just as easy, it's easy for me just to click this eyeball here on the layers panel in order to hide, in order to hide those squares. So I can turn those back on. I can also lock the squares, so that way they aren't selectable. So if I want to select a few things, notice how it selected all of these circles, the arrow, but not the squares, because the squares are locked. Turn off visibility. And then finally, if I select this, or click this empty circle to the right, it will select all of the objects that are in the layer. Super easy. Very clear. Uh, this also helps you, the layers also help you with the display of the objects on the art panel. And so what that means is because the square is located above the circles layer, if I click and drag this circle above this or this square above the circle and I let go, it's going to be on top of the circle. So if you imagine these layers as like sheets of paper stacked, if I click and drag and bring the square to the bottom, the circle is going to be on top. And if I click and drag and put it back, there it is. So, so those are the main benefits. Controlling visibility, locking and unlocking, making easy selections, and then in terms of display and deciding where, where things are relative to it. Okay, great. Let's talk about tracing objects, because this is a really useful, powerful thing that Illustrator does. Uh, it allows you to bring in JPEGs, and then you can either live trace them or manually trace them. So let's talk about both of those. I'm going to bring in an image, 
there's a couple ways to do that. One is to go File Place, and that will give me an Explorer uh, or a Finder prompt, and then I can bring in either of these images and hit Place, and so that brings in this uh, photo of a parking meter. Uh, alternatively, if you go directly to Finder or Explorer, and I come to my desktop, I can click and drag the parking meter into this artboard. You see it gets the plus sign and drops it in. Uh, it makes it really easy. So I'm going to put it on my circles layer, and then I'm going to lock that layer. And now I'm going to come to my arrows layer, which is my top layer, and I'm going to trace just the outline of this parking meter because I want to show you how easy it is to take things and trace them manually. So I'm going to click on my pen tool. I'm going to zoom down here. And I'm just going to start tra just clicking and tracing. So click on the base. Uh, I'm going to hold down the shift key so it's going to be straight up. I'm going to come over. I'm going to make, I'm going to click and drag this guy to make it a handle. And then click and drag here so I can define that corner. And then do the same thing over here. So I get that get that curvature where you like it. And so it's pretty straightforward. Just a lot of clicking. You want to just have some control over it. With the pen tool, if you mouse over an anchor, you get this little wedge symbol. And what that basically means is it's ready to convert an anchor without handles to an anchor with handles. And so I want to do that in order to capture this half circle. Alternatively, one thing I could do is come to this ellipse tool, hold down my alt, my shift key at the center, and get that half circle shape. Get it to about the size that I want it. And hit V or click the selection arrow and move it down here. So sometimes it's, it's easy to, to just uh, start to pick geometry apart. So then what I'm going to do is click with my direct selection tool. I can either hit A or click it up here. Click on the path and then click and drag the anchor until it intersects. Okay. So I'm going to turn off the circles layer. So you can already see here's the outline. This is a bit messy. So what I'm going to come in. So I'm going to come in here and just move that anchor over. Move this handle. So what I can do now is, because this is a uniform shape, and I know that it's symmetrical, so the left side is identical to the right side, I could redraw it. Or, to make it easier on myself, what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to mirror this path. So if you click and hold on, this, on the Rotate tool, you'll get the Reflect tool. And what it does is, is it gives you this anchor point. I want the anchor, um, I want the anchor in the center of the circle. Right, so that's that bottom anchor point. And then I'm just going to click and drag going down, and that's going to mirror that shape for me. And then I'm going to hold the Alt key, and that's going to make a copy. And so you can see that indicated by my cursor. There are two cursors now. So when I let go, it makes a copy. So it wasn't quite there, so I'm just going to cheat it a little bit. Just cheat it. All right, and there we go. So that's how you start to trace trace an object. Um, if I wanted to cut this path, so right now this circle is totally complete. If you click and hold underneath the eraser tool, there's a scissors tool. And what the scissors tool does is it basically just cuts the path. So now uh, the top half of the circle is a different path from the bottom half of the circle, so I can just erase that. And so as you can see, you start to get the shape and the form of this parking meter. Uh, and sometimes it's more important, depending on what you're doing, uh, because I know this thing is symmetrical, it might not be totally symmetrical in the photo, so it's more important that it's symmetrical in relation to the geometry I'm drawing and not necessarily to the photo I'm tracing. And these kinds of projects, I mean, you can get into real detail and trace everything to get like as much as much or as little detail as you want out of what you're tracing. So that's great if you're 
working with a base layer of a parcel map for some land use project or um, there's some uh, other like street geometry or building outlines is another thing that I find myself tracing a lot of. Okay, so let's talk about live trace because this is a really cool, powerful feature. So I'm going to go file place and bring in this food truck clip art. Let's say I was doing a, a project on food trucks, but notice that this, this image is really small and if I go to my finder window it will tell me that it's 33 kilobits which is totally tiny and it has dimensions of 600 by 381 pixels which means that if I wanted to include this in a print document I couldn't make it any bigger than about one inch by two inch or else it would start to get pixelated. So I can avoid that if I bring it in and what I want to do is I want to convert it to a vector because if I convert this to a vector and if I zoom in here you can see all of this, these jagged tooth edges from all the pixels. If I can successfully convert this into a vector, then it becomes infinitely scalable and I can put it into any size that I want. So if I was making like a big 36 by 36 inch poster, I could easily just drop it in there. So how you do that is you click on the object and then here in the, the options bar, you can see it's a linked file. I'm gonna click M image trace. And what that's gonna do is convert this into a vector and so now as I zoom in here you can see that jagged tooth is all gone now it's just one smooth stroke connecting another so that means that even if I scaled this thing up to the size of a billboard it would be the same size uh, and you have if you're you have some preset um, options down here so this can be really great if you have uh, if you have a photo you can have a high fidelity photo or if you have a, a logo um, really the, the possibilities for this tool are endless and they allow you to take something that would be really small and really limiting and once you trace it then you can hit expand and what that's going to do is it's going to turn um, all of this into manipulatable geometry so I'm just going to delete uh, some of this white space and so you can see here with my direct selection tool if I zoom in real close that now instead of being a bunch of pixels it's a vector this is a vector object that has uh, four four anchor points and four paths and so what's great is that now that this is a vector uh, if I use my scale tool I can make it as big as I want and regardless of how big it gets it will never lose any resolution so it's it's perfect for like poster projects or if you find some clip art um, it makes it really easy to to, to capture that and to, to use it in any kind of project that you want. Okay, so let's talk about saving. Uh, there's a few different ways to save your work. Uh, if you do a file save as or file save if you've named it, that's just going to save the Illustrator file. So I could save it on my desktop just as practice, which is great. Um, don't touch any of these options. The defaults are fine. Uh, what's nice about Illustrator uh, CS6 and some versions previous to it is that it will create a PDF compatible file, which means that even if I sent this Illustrator file to someone who didn't have Adobe Illustrator, they could still open it uh, with any Adobe, Adobe software. So I'm just going to save that. Uh, so that's good for your working file. You can also save a copy uh, commonly as like a PDF is a great thing to save it as or as a S SVG or EPS. These are all vector based formats. So they're great if you're going from another vector program or another Adobe piece of software and you don't know how big the thing is, uh, your final product, it will maintain uh, its proportionality and it won't be flattened and become a raster it will stay as a vector alternatively if you want to export this as a image file so as a uh, raster based file in this drop down menu in the format you have lots of different options for like a PNG file which is good because it has a transparent background uh, bitmap JPEG uh, TIFF for something that's really high resolution there's a bunch of different options here and then you have the choice if you want to use the artboard or not if you use the artboard, it will uh, export an image that is the size of the artboard, regardless of the artwork that's on it, versus if you uh, export it 
and you uh, don't click artboards, then it's just going to export the bounding box that contains the work itself. So it would just export what's contained in the blue. Okay, great. Well, I think that's all for me today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this quick introduction to Adobe Illustrator, and it's enough to get you up and running. There's lots of great resources online uh, that explain all of these different tools and all the different workflows. I highly recommend checking out lynda.com, which you can access for free as a UCLA student through learnit.ucla.edu, or just do a Google search. There's lots of great resources available online. Thanks for watching, and good luck.